The Girl on the Train by Paula Hawkins. Friday morning, the 5th of July, 2013. The 8.04 slow train from Ashbury to Euston can test the patience of the most seasoned commuter. Someone in the seat behind me gives a sigh of irritation as a train crawls along, past modest Victorian houses, their backs turned squarely to the track. Twice a day I'm offered a view into others' lives, just for a moment. There's something comforting about the sight of strangers safe at home. Coming back to Ashbury that evening, I don't have to feel guilty about drinking on the train because it's Friday. The pre-mixed gin and tonic fizzes up over the lip of the can, tangy and cold. The taste of my first ever holiday with Tom. A fishing village on the Basque coast in 2005. The weekend stretches ahead of me. Forty-eight empty hours to fill. Monday morning. It's a relief to be back on the 804. There's a faulty signal on this line about halfway through my journey. We stop there most days. If I sit in carriage D, which I usually do, I have a perfect view into my favourite trackside house. Number 15. Like all the other houses along this stretch is a Victorian semi, overlooking a narrow, well-tended garden. I know that on warm summer evenings the occupants Jason and Jess, I call them, sit on the makeshift terrace on top of the kitchen extension roof. They're a perfect golden couple. He is dark-haired and well-built. She a beauty, pale-skinned with blonde hair cropped short. This evening coming home, I open one of the little bottles of wine I bought at Euston, even though it's less acceptable to drink on the train on a Monday. We whip past Jason and Jess's place. They pass in a blur of evening sunshine. Tuesday morning. The train stops at the signal as usual. I can see Jess standing on the patio in front of the French doors. I keep my eyes fixed on her as the train starts to inch forward. I don't want to see the other houses. I particularly don't want to see the one four doors down. The one that used to be mine. I lived at number 23 Blenheim Road for five years. Every day I tell myself not to look, and every day I look, even though I remember the pain I felt when I saw Anna watering the rose bushes near the fence, her t-shirt stretched tight over her bulging belly, and I bit my lip so hard it bled. The train I take in the evening, the 1756, is slightly slower than the morning one. I don't mind, because I'm in no hurry to get back to Ashbury. I live in a newish block of flats, but it's not my home. In Ashbury, I'm a lodger, occupant of the small second bedroom in Cathy's duplex, subject to her grace and favour. Cathy and I were friends at university, and in my hour of need she happened to have a spare room going. That was nearly two years ago. It's not awful. Cathy's a nice person, in a forceful sort of way. But I always feel like a guest at the very outer limit of their welcome. Thursday morning. I'm picking at the plaster on my forefinger. I don't want to take it off because the cut is deep. Cathy was out when I got home, so I went to the off-license and bought two bottles of wine. I drank the first one, and then I thought I'd cook myself a steak. I sliced my finger while chopping the onions. After Cathy and Damien had gone to bed, I opened the second bottle of wine, sat on the sofa and watched television. I can't remember what I was watching, but at some point I wanted to talk to someone. There was no one I could call except Tom. I rang four times and left two messages. I remember the first. I think I just asked him to call me. The train shudders to a standstill at the red signal and I look up. I find myself looking directly into my house. And now I remember. I didn't just ask him to call me back, I was crying. I told him that I still loved him, that I always would. Please, Tom, I need to talk to you. 
I miss you. I think about Jess all day. Coming home this evening, I feel exhausted. My phone buzzes in my handbag. It's Tom. Rachel, it's me. Listen, you have to stop this, okay? I don't say anything. The train is slowing and we are almost opposite my old house. I want to say to him, Come outside, stand on the lawn. Let me see you. Please, Rachel, you can't call me like this all the time. I can't help you any more. I pull the filthy plaster off the end of my finger and press the thumbnail of my right hand into the centre of the cut. I feel it open up. The pain, sharp and hot. Blood starts to ooze from the wound. One year earlier, 2012. Wednesday, the 16th of May. I can hear the train coming. More often than not, there's a screech of brakes as it stops at the signal, a couple of hundred yards from the house. Sitting here in the morning, eyes closed, and the hot sun orange on my eyelids, I could be anywhere. The south of Spain, Italy, even back in Hokum, with a screech of gulls in my ears and salt on my tongue. I can hear his footfall on the stairs. He calls my name. Want another coffee, Megs? This evening, I'm out on the terrace, waiting for Scott to come home. I didn't get much done today. I was supposed to sort out my application for the fabrics course at St. Martin's. I, I did start it when I heard a woman screaming. I thought someone was being murdered. I ran upstairs and climbed out on the terrace. Through the trees, I could see two women a few gardens over. One of them was crying, and there was a child bawling its head off, too. I thought about calling the police, but it all seemed to calm down. The woman who'd been screaming ran into the house, carrying the baby. The other one sort of wandered round the garden in circles. It was really weird. My days feel empty now. I don't have the gallery to go to any longer. Sometimes I feel like tracking down somebody from the old days. But then I don't think they would even recognise Megan, the happily married suburbanite. Now, I'll wait until summer's over, and then I'll look for work. It seems a shame to waste these long summer days. Tuesday the 14th of August. I flounce downstairs. Scott's in the kitchen. He turns to me with a grin, hands me a coffee and kisses me. Now, there's no sense blaming him for this. It was my idea. I volunteered to become a childminder for the people down the road. Must have been mad. I think, I think I got the idea after I heard her yelling out in the garden and I wanted to know what was going on. Now, Scott encouraged me. He thinks spending time around babies will make me broody. In fact, he's doing exactly the opposite. Thursday, the 16th of August. I quit. I'm free. I didn't really mean to quit. The words just came out. We were sitting there around the kitchen table, Anna with the baby on her lap, and Tom had just popped back to pick something up, so he was there too, drinking a cup of coffee, and it just seemed ridiculous. I mean, there was absolutely no point in me being there. I found another job. I said, without really thinking about it. So I'm not going to be able to do this any longer. Anna gave me a look. I don't think she believed me. Tom looked mildly surprised. He said, we'll miss you, but that's a lie too. The only person who'll really be disappointed is Scott. So I have to think of something to tell him. Thursday, the 20th of September. It's just after 7am. I've been up for hours. I can't sleep. I want to run. I want to take a road trip. Me and my big brother were going to be road trippers. We had such plans, Ben and I. But Ben died on the A10. I miss him every day. 
He's the big hole in my life. Or maybe he was just the beginning of it. So I am going to see a therapist. At least this feels like action. His name is Dr. Kamal Abdich. I guess he must be mid-thirties, although he looks very young with his incredible dark honey skin. He has hands I can imagine on me. Long and delicate fingers. I tell him about the panic attacks, the insomnia, the fact that I lie awake at night too frightened to fall asleep. Tuesday the 25th of September. Scott's just called to say he has to work late. I'm feeling edgy. I can't just sit here. I go out. On the way back, he passes me in his car. Our eyes meet for just a second, and he smiles at me. 2013, Friday, the 12th of July. The screech of the train's brakes wakes me. We're at the signal. I can see Jess in her garden, and behind her a man walking out of the house carrying a mug of coffee. It isn't Jason. This man is taller, slender, darker. Jess walks towards him. She puts her hands around his waist and kisses him, long and deep. The train moves. I can't believe it. Why would she do that? Jason loves her. He doesn't deserve that. I feel a familiar ache in my chest. I found out the way everyone seems to find out these days. An electronic slip. In my case, it was an email. The modern day lipstick on the collar. I wasn't supposed to go near Tom's computer, but I was planning a special fourth anniversary getaway. I wanted it to be a surprise, so I had to check his work schedule secretly. I had to look. He had left his laptop on because he had run out late for a meeting. It was a perfect opportunity, so I had a look at his calendar. When I closed down the browser window, there was his email account logged in, laid bare. There was a message at the top. XXXX. I thought it was spam at first until I realised that they were kisses. It was a reply to a message he had sent a few hours before, just after seven when I was still slumbering. I fell asleep last night thinking of you. I was dreaming about kissing your mouth, your breasts, the inside of your thighs. I woke this morning with my head full of you, desperate to touch you. Don't expect me to be sane, I can't be, not with you. I discovered that her name was Anna Boyd, and that my husband was in love with her. He told her that he'd never felt like this before that he couldn't wait to be with her. I don't have words to describe what I felt that day, but now, sitting on the train, I'm furious. Nails digging into my palms, tears stinging my eyes. How could Jess do this? What is wrong with her? Hatred floods me. If I saw Jess now, I would spit in her face. I would scratch her eyes out. Saturday morning, the 13th of July, 2013. I think about Jess kissing her lover in the morning sunshine. I spent all day in my bedroom, waiting for Kathy to go out so that I could have a drink. She didn't. By late afternoon, I couldn't stand the confinement any longer, so I told her I was going for a walk. I went to the wheat sheaf, drank three large glasses of wine and had two shots of Jack Daniels. Then I walked to the station, bought a couple of cans of gin and tonic and got onto the train. There's a man on the opposite side of the train. Sandy blonde hair veering towards Ginger. He's smiling at me. Is he smiling at me or is he sneering? I can't tell. I'm going to see Jason. This is not a good idea. This is a very bad idea. Sunday morning. My heartbeat feels as though it's in the base of my throat, uncomfortable and loud. 
My mouth is dry. It hurts to swallow. Something is wrong. Last night, something happened, something bad. What was it? I went to the pub. I got onto the train. I was at the station. I was on Blenheim Road. I run my hands through my hair. I flinch. There's a lump, painful and tender, on the right side of my head. My hair is matted with blood. I stumbled, that's it. On the stairs at Whitney Station. Did I hit my head? Think. What did I do? I went to the pub. I got on the train. There was a man there. I remember now. Reddish hair. I think he talked to me, but I can't remember what he said. There's something more to him, but I can't reach it. I look around the room. My mobile isn't on the bedside table. My handbag isn't on the floor. It's not hanging over the back of the chair where I usually leave it. I get out of bed. There are bruises on my legs. I feel sick. I grab my dressing gown and open the bedroom door just a crack. The flat is quiet. My handbag has been dumped in the hallway just inside the front door. My jeans and underwear sit next to it in a crumpled pile. I can smell the urine from the bottom of the stairs. The nausea comes over me again, stronger this time. I run, but I don't make it to the bathroom. I vomit on the carpet halfway up the stairs. I have to lie down. If I don't lie down, I'm going to pass out. I'll clean it up later. Upstairs, I plug in my phone and lie on the bed. There's a message from Tom. Received at 10.15. He's shouting. Rachel, what the hell is wrong with you? I've just spent the best part of an hour driving around looking for you. You've really frightened Anna. You know that. It's all I could do to get her not to ring the police. Stop calling me. I don't want to speak to you. I don't want you anywhere near my family. Just stay away from us. What did I do? Between five o'clock and ten fifteen, what was I doing? Why was Tom looking for me? What did I do to Anna? I pour the duvet over my head. I close my eyes. Someone is shouting. I've been sleeping a long time. My head hurts. I can hear someone yelling downstairs. I do not believe this. For God's sake, Rachel! Oh, God. I fell asleep. I didn't clear up the vomit on the stairs and my clothes in the hallway. Oh, God. I pull on a pair of tracksuit bottoms and a T-shirt. Kathy is standing right outside my bedroom door. She looks horrified when she sees me. What on earth happened to you? She raises her hand. Actually, Rachel, I don't want to know. I cannot have this in my house. I'm sorry, Rachel. You have to go. Okay? I'll give you four weeks to find somewhere else. And for the love of Mike, will you clean up that mess? She slams her bedroom door behind her. 2012. Tuesday, the 2nd of October. I got up in the night, left Scott sleeping and sneaked down to the terrace. I dialed his number and listened to his voice when he picked up. I hung up and waited to see if he'd call back. He didn't, so I called again and again and again. I got voicemail then. Bland and businesslike, promising to call me back at his earliest convenience. So I went back to bed. I didn't sleep at all, thinking about this afternoon session. Dr. Abditch, Kamal, as I've been invited to call him, suggested that I start keeping a diary. I could never write down the things I actually feel. I couldn't trust Scott not to read it. A case in point, when I came home this evening, my laptop was warm. I know that I turned the computer off before I left. He's been reading my emails again. I don't really mind. There's nothing to read in there and it reassures him that I'm not up to anything, even if it isn't true. I can't really be angry with him because he has good reason to be suspicious. I'm not a model wife. Saturday the 13th, 
I told myself that I wouldn't do it again, not after last time. But then I saw him, and I wanted him, and I thought, why not? I don't want to hurt anybody, but all I'm doing is being true to my real self, the self nobody knows, not Scott, not Kamal, no one. After my Pilates class last night, I asked Tara if she'd cover for me. She smiled. All right. She didn't even ask me where I was going or who with. I met him at the Swan in Corley. He got us a room. We have to be careful. We can't get caught. It would be bad for him, life-wrecking. I don't even want to think about what Scott would do. Monday evening, the 15th of July, 2013. I'm sitting in A&E at University College Hospital. I was knocked down by a taxi while crossing Gray's Inn Road. I'm having an inch-long cut above my right eye stitched up by an extremely handsome junior doctor. When he's finished, he notices the bump on my head. It's not new, I say. I bumped it getting into a car. He stands back and looks me in the eye. It doesn't look like it. It looks more like someone's hit you with something. I go cold. I have a memory of ducking down to avoid a blow, raising my hands. Is that a real memory? He looks at me for a long time. Perhaps he thinks I'm a battered wife. Right, I'm going to clean this up. Is there someone I can call for you? I give him Kathy's number. She'll probably think I got knocked down because I was drunk. I wasn't was sober as a judge, but I ran right out in front of the cab. I was thinking about Jess. Who isn't Jess? She's Megan Hipwell, and she's missing. I'd been in the library on Theobald's Road. I'd just emailed my mother via my Yahoo account, and on Yahoo's front page there are news stories geared to your postcode, and there was a picture of her, Jess, my Jess, perfect blonde next to a headline which read, Concern for Missing Whitney Woman. 29-year-old Megan Hipwell of Blenheim Road, Whitney, was last seen by her husband, Scott Hipwell, on Saturday night when she went to visit a friend at around seven o'clock. Mrs. Hipwell, five foot four, slim with blonde hair and blue eyes, was wearing jeans and a red t-shirt. Jess is missing. Megan is missing. Since Saturday, I grabbed my bag and ran out of the library, right into the path of a black cab. Thursday the 10th of January, 2013. When I'm with Kamal, I have to focus. It's hard not to think of the things we could do together. We've been talking about what happened after Ben's funeral, after I ran off. I was in Ipswich for a while. I met Mac there. He was working in a pub. He felt sorry for me and picked me up on his way home. We got back to his flat, I said, and I asked for the money. He looked at me like I was mad. He waited, he did, until my 16th birthday. He'd moved by then to this old house near Hokum, an old stone cottage at the end of a lane leading nowhere about half a mile from the beach. I was actually really happy there with Mac. I lived with him for three years, I think, in the end. I was 19 when I left. Why did you leave, he says, if you were happy there? We got there quicker than I thought we would. I can't do it. It's too soon. Mac left me, I say. He broke my heart. Which is a truth, but also a lie. I'm not ready to tell the whole truth yet. Friday morning, the 8th of February. Scott is away, on a course somewhere in Sussex. He left yesterday morning, and he's not back until tonight. I can do whatever I want. After my session with Kamal, 
I asked him if he wanted to have a drink with me. He said no, no, he couldn't, it wouldn't be appropriate. So I followed him home. I knocked on his door, and when he opened it, I asked, Is this appropriate? I slipped my hand around the back of his neck, stood on tiptoe, and kissed him on the mouth. Megan, he said, don't, I can't do this. It was exquisite. That push and pull, desire and restraint. I didn't want to let the feeling go. I wanted so badly to be able to hold on to it. Tuesday, the 16th of July. I'm on the 804, but I'm not going into London. I'm going to Whitney. I'm hoping that being there will jog my memory. Megan is still missing. She's been gone more than 60 hours now, and the story is becoming national news. It was on the BBC website. I printed out the story and gleaned the following. Megan and Scott argued on Saturday evening, and Scott said he believed his wife had gone to spend the night with a friend, Tara Epstein who lives in Corley. Megan never got to Tara's house. Megan was seen by one witness walking towards Whitney train station at around 7.15 on Saturday evening. Megan is unemployed. She used to run a small art gallery in Whitney, but it closed down in April last year. Scott is a self-employed IT consultant. Megan and Scott have been married for three years. They'd been living in the house on Blenheim Road since January 2012. Things look bad for Scott. Not just because of the argument, but when something bad happens to a woman, the police look at the husband or the boyfriend first. However, in this case, the police don't have all the facts. They're only looking at the husband, presumably because they don't know about the boyfriend. It could be that I am the only person who knows that the boyfriend exists. The bump on my head is throbbing. And I can't stop thinking about the argument I saw, or imagined, or dreamed about, on Saturday night. As we pass Megan and Scott's house, I look up. The windows of number 15 reflecting morning sunshine look like sightless eyes. It was so strange. This morning, I tripped to Whitney. Down the concrete steps at the station, past the newspaper kiosk into Rosebury Avenue, half a block to the end of the T-junction. On the right, the archway leading to the dank pedestrian underpass beneath the track. On the left, Blenheim Road, narrow and tree-lined. But walking past the blackened tunnel mouth, I looked into the darkness and I stopped dead. I could suddenly see myself a few metres in, slumped against the wall, head and hands smeared with blood. My heart thudded in my chest. Something bad happened there, I know it did. I turned around and headed back to the station. I paid for my ticket and walked quickly up the steps to the other side of the platform. As I did so, again a flash. Not the underpass this time, but the steps. Stumbling on the steps and a man taking my arm, helping me up. The man from the train, with the reddish hair. I could see him. A vague picture, but no dialogue. He was nice to me, I'm almost sure of it. Something bad happened. But I don't think it had anything to do with him. Coming back that evening, I'm just settling into my seat when my phone rings. It's Kathy. I let it go to voicemail. Hi, Rachel. I just wanted to say that I'm sorry about the other day, what I said about moving out. I overreacted. You can stay as long as you want to. Give me a ring, okay? Then, just as we're reaching Ashbury, my phone rings. It's Kathy again. Rach, are you on the train? Yes, I say. I'll be 15 minutes. Rachel, the police are here. They want to talk to you. Wednesday morning, the 17th of July. By the time I got back to the flat last night, I was in a panic. I must have done something on Saturday night, committed some terrible act and blacked it out. What could I have done? 
gone to Blenheim Road, attacked Megan Hipwell, disposed of her body somewhere, and then forgotten all about it. Sounds ridiculous, but by the time I got home, I'd convinced myself that I was in some way involved in Megan's disappearance. The police officers were in the living room, a forty-something man in plain clothes and a younger one in uniform. The plain clothes one introduced himself as Detective Inspector Gaskill. We need to talk to you about what you did on Saturday evening, Miss Watson. I went to Whitney. I wanted to see my husband. But then I decided it wasn't a good idea, so I came home. What time was this? I got the train around six o'clock. And you came home just after eight. Okay. So you left around six, meaning you'd be in Whitney by 6.30, and you were back here around eight, which means you must have left Whitney around 7.30. And you didn't actually go to see your ex-husband. So what did you do during that hour in Whitney? I walked around for a bit. Did you speak to anyone? Go to any shops, bars? I spoke to a man in the station. Why do you need to know this? What's going on? You may have heard that a woman from Whitney, a woman who lives on Blenheim Road, just a few doors along from your ex-husband, is missing. We've been asking people if they remember seeing her that night, or if they remember anything unusual. And during the course of our inquiries, your name came up. He let this sink in. You were seen on Blenheim Road that evening, around the time that Mrs. Hipwell, the missing woman, left home. Mrs. Anna Watson told us that she saw you in the street near Mrs. Hipwell's home, acting strangely. She considered calling the police. I couldn't speak. All I could see at that moment was myself, slouched in the underpass, blood on my hands. My blood, surely. Gaskell pulled a photograph out of his pocket. It was a picture of Megan. Did you see this woman on Saturday night? I stared at it for a long time. The perfect blonde I'd watched whose life I had constructed and deconstructed in my head. Miss Watson, did you see her? I don't think so, I'm not sure. Gaskell got to his feet. If you remember anything about Saturday night, would you please call me? He handed me a business card. You work in public relations, is that right? Huntingdon Whiteley? That's right, I said. Huntingdon Whiteley. He's going to check. He's going to know I lied. I can't let him find out for himself. So this morning I'm going to go round to the police station to come clean. I was shown into a small stuffy room and left there for ten minutes, before Gaskell and a woman, also in plain clothes, turned up. Gaskell introduced his companion as Detective Sergeant Riley. She did not return my smile. We all sat down and they looked at me expectantly. I don't work for Huntington Whiteley any longer, I said. I left three months ago. My flatmate, well, she's my landlady, really. I haven't told her. I'm trying to find another job. I didn't want her to know because I thought that she would worry about the rent. Anyway, I lied to you yesterday and I apologise for that. Riley leaned forward. Your flatmate, she hasn't noticed that you don't go to work every day. I go into London, the way I used to, at the same time, so she won't know. It sounds odd, I know. I tailed off, because it doesn't just sound odd, it sounds insane. Riley looked at me. Ms. Watson, your ex-husband's current wife, Mrs. Anna Watson, told us that you have been bothering her and her husband, and that on one occasion you broke into their home and took their newborn baby. A black hole opened up in the centre of the room and swallowed me. That's not true. I didn't take her. I didn't break into their home. I, I did go there. I, I wanted to speak to Tom. No one answered the doorbell. So how did you get in? said Riley. The sliding door at the back was open. The one leading into the garden. I climbed over the fence and I knocked on the glass doors which were partly open. There was no answer, but I, I could hear a baby crying. I went inside and saw that Mrs. Watson was on the sofa, sleeping. The baby was in the carry cot, screaming, red in the face. I picked her up to comfort her. That's all. 
That's not all, though, is it? Because when Anna woke up, you weren't there, were you? You were down by the fence, by the train tracks. She didn't stop crying right away, I said, so I, I walked outside with her, down to the train tracks, into the garden. The night Megan went missing, we have reports that you, an unstable woman who had been drinking heavily, was seen on the street where she lives, bearing in mind that there are some physical similarities between Megan and Mrs. Watson. So I attacked Megan Hipwell thinking she was Anna. That's the most stupid thing I've ever heard. I push my chair back. Time to play the trump card. I take it you've spoken to Megan Hipwell's lover? They stared at me. They weren't expecting that. They didn't know about him. Perhaps he didn't know. Megan Hipwell was having an affair. I started to walk to the door. Before I could put my hand on the door handle, Gasker was standing in front of me. I thought you didn't know Megan Hipwell. I don't. Sit down, he said. I told them then about what I'd seen from the train, about how often I saw Megan sitting out on her terrace, sunbathing in the evenings, or having a coffee in the mornings. I told them about how last week I saw her with someone who clearly wasn't her husband, how I'd seen them kissing on the lawn. When was this? said Gaskell. Friday morning. Can you describe him? Taller than Scott Hipwell. Slighter, thinner, darker skin. Possibly an Asian man. Gaskell got to his feet. I think that's enough. I turned to go. Don't go anywhere near Blenheim Road, Ms. Watson, said Gaskell. Don't go anywhere near Anna Watson or her child. Thursday evening, the 18th of July. The train is full of rain-soaked people. As soon as I got myself a seat, I checked the latest on Megan's case on my phone, and it's the news I've been dreading. A 35-year-old man is being questioned under caution at Whitney Police Station regarding the disappearance of Megan Hipwell, missing from her home since Saturday evening. That's Scott. I'm sure of it. I can only hope that he read my email before they picked him up, because questioning under caution is serious. It means they think he did it. I sent Scott an email this morning. His address was easy to find. I googled him and found the site where he advertises. His business address is also his home address. Dear Scott, my name is Rachel Watson. You don't know me. I would like to talk to you about your wife. I don't know what has happened to her, but I believe I have information that could help you. Yours sincerely, Rachel. The train comes to an abrupt halt, brakes screeching alarmingly. I glance up and find myself looking right into the eyes of the man from Saturday night, the ginger one, the man who helped me up. He's staring right at me, his startlingly blue eyes locked on mine. He smiles at me, his head cocked a little to one side. I turn away, and in seconds we're pulling into Whitney Station. I look up again, and I'm flooded with relief. He's getting off the train. The doors beep and close. I look out at the window as the train pulls away. He's standing on the edge of the platform in the rain, the man from Saturday night, watching me as I go past. Thursday afternoon, the 7th of March. The room is dark. The air close. Sweet with the smell of us. We're at the swan again, in the room under the eaves. Where do you want to go, he says. A house on the beach, on the Costa de la Luz. He smiles. What will we do? He kisses me on the tip of my hip bone. Apart from this. We'll open a cafe. Show art. Learn to surf. He laughs and moves his body up over mine and kisses me. Irresistible. You're irresistible. I want to laugh. 
I want to say it out loud. See, I win. I told you it wasn't the last time. It's never the last time. I bite my lip and close my eyes. I was right. I knew I was. But it won't do me any good to say it. I enjoy my victory silently. Afterwards, he talks to me as he hasn't done before. He talks about the family he left behind, the woman before me and the one before that, the one who wrecked his head and left him hollow. I don't believe in soulmates, but there's an understanding between us. It comes from shared experience. Hollowness. That I understand. I'm starting to believe that there isn't anything you can do to fix it. That's what I've taken from the therapy sessions. The holes in your life are permanent. You have to grow around them, like tree roots around concrete. When will we go? I ask him. But he doesn't answer me. And I fall asleep. When I wake up, he's gone. Friday morning, the 8th of March. Scott brings me coffee on the terrace. He's standing behind me, hands on my shoulders, warm and solid. I lean my head back against his body. He leans forward and kisses my neck. You slept last night, he says. You must be feeling better. I am. Do you think it's work then, the therapy? I think it's a process. I don't know if there'll be a time when I can say that I'm better. So you want to keep going, he asks. And I tell him I do. There was a time when I thought he could be enough. I loved him completely. I still do. But I don't want this any longer. The only time I feel like me is on those secret, febrile afternoons like yesterday. I come alive. I mean, who's to say that once I run, I'll find that isn't enough? Who's to say that I won't end up feeling exactly the way I do right now, not safe, but stifled? Maybe I'll want to run again and again. Maybe. Maybe not. But you have to take the risk, don't you? I go downstairs to say goodbye as he's heading off to work. He slips his arms around my waist and kisses the top of my head. Love you, Megs, he murmurs. And I feel horrible then. Like the worst person in the world. I can't wait for him to shut the door because I know I'm going to cry. Friday the 19th of July. I've had a good day. I spent an hour alone with Detective Inspector Gaskell this morning. He asked me to call at the station. This time we sat in his office. He offered me coffee, and I was surprised to find that he got up and made it for me himself. It felt different this morning. I didn't feel like a suspect. Someone he was trying to catch out. I felt useful. I felt most useful when he took one of his folders and laid it in front of me, showing me a series of photographs. Scott Hipwell, three men I'd never seen before, and then Megan's boyfriend. That's him, I said. He scrutinised the picture. You saw them kissing. Last Friday, was it? That's right, Friday morning. They were outside in the garden. Who is he? Gaskell didn't reply, just shook his head a little. Have I been helpful at all? Yes, Miss Watson. You've been very helpful. Thank you for coming in. Saturday. I wake with a crushing sensation of shame, and I know immediately that I've done something stupid. I go through my achingly familiar ritual of trying to remember exactly what I did. I sent an email. That's what it was. At some point last night, I sent Tom an email. I take my laptop downstairs and make a cup of tea. I open my email account, and there it is. Sent just after eleven last night. I've been drinking for a good few hours by then. 
Could you please tell your wife to stop lying to the police about me? Pretty low, don't you think? Trying to get me into trouble. Telling the police I'm obsessed with her and her ugly brat. Tell her to leave me alone. I snapped the laptop shut. I'm cringing, literally. I want to disappear. Why did I mention the little girl? I don't bear her any ill will. I couldn't think badly of any child, and especially not Tom's child. I could apologise. If I apologise right now, I might be able to salvage something. That day last summer, when I went to Tom and Anna's, it didn't happen exactly the way I told the police. When I looked through the sliding doors, it's true that Anna was sleeping on the sofa, but the baby wasn't crying. She was fast asleep in her carry cot. I picked her up, and I remember running with her towards the fence. I don't know what I thought I was doing. I got to the fence, holding her tightly against my chest. Now she was crying. I bounced and shushed her, and then I heard a train coming. I turned my back to the fence and saw Anna hurtling towards me, her lips moving, but I couldn't hear what she was saying. She took the child from me and I tried to run away, but I tripped and fell. Then she was standing over me, screaming at me. She told me to stay put or she'd call the police. She rang Tom and he came home and calmed her down. He saved me from her. Afterwards he drove me home. And when he dropped me off he took my hand. I thought it was a gesture of kindness. But he squeezed tighter and tighter until I cried out. And his face was red when he told me he would kill me if I did anything to harm his daughter. I opened my laptop again. I have to apologise. I have to beg forgiveness. I log back into my email account and see that I have one new message. It's from Scott Hipwell. Dear Rachel, thank you for contacting me. I would like to talk to you about what you know. Please telephone me as soon as possible. Regards, Scott Hipwell. I start writing to Tom, writing and deleting, trying to find ways to ask forgiveness for the things I said last night. Then I phone Scott. Sitting here on the train in my usual seat, though not on my usual day, I feel as though I'm driving off a cliff. I knew, as I was agreeing to meet him at his house, that it wasn't a good idea. I know almost nothing about Scott. All I know for certain is that his wife has been missing for a week and, because I saw that kiss, that he has a motive to kill her. Of course, he might not know that he has a motive, but... Oh, I've tied myself up in knots thinking about it. But how could I pass up the opportunity to go into the house that I've observed a hundred times from the trackside, to sit on his terrace, where they sat, where I watched them? It was too tempting. Saturday morning, my birthday. We're happy. We had lunch and lay out on the lawn, and then when it got too hot we came inside and ate ice cream while Tom watched the Grand Prix. Evie and I made Play-Doh, and she ate quite a bit of that too. When I look at Tom, I thank God that he found me, that I was there to rescue him from that woman. She'd have driven him mad in the end. Tom's taken Evie upstairs to give her a bath. I can hear her squealing with delight from here and I'm smiling. The smile has barely fallen from my lips all day. I do the washing up and think about dinner. Something light. A few years ago I'd have hated the idea of staying in and cooking on my birthday. But now it's perfect. It's the way it should be. Just the three of us. I pick up Evie's toys, scattered around the living room floor. I'm leaning over the sofa when I see a woman, her head bent to her chest, scuttling along the pavement on the opposite side of the street. She doesn't look up, but it's her. I'm sure of it. I turn, ready to bolt out of the front door to chase her down the street. But Tom's standing in the doorway, Evie wrapped in a towel in his arms. You okay? he says. What's wrong? Nothing. 
I stuff my hands into my pockets so that he can't see them shaking. Sunday morning. I made an effort yesterday. I washed my hair and put some makeup on. I took the train and was in Whitney just after seven. I took that walk along Rosebury Avenue, past the underpass. I didn't look this time. I hurried past number 23, Tom and Anna's place, chin to chest and sunglasses on, praying they wouldn't see me. Scott opened the door almost before I had finished knocking. Rachel, he said, looking down at me unsmiling. I nodded. Up close he is physically intimidating, tall and broad-shouldered. It crossed my mind that he could crush me without much effort. I moved past him into the hallway. He smelled of old sweat. He showed me into the kitchen and offered me a cup of tea. I sat at the kitchen table while he boiled the kettle. There was a sharp smell of antiseptic in the room, but Scott himself was a mess, a sweat patch on the back of his T-shirt. He placed the mug of tea in front of me and sat on the opposite side of the kitchen table. You're a friend of Megan's, he said. I know her a little, from the gallery. You said in your email that you wanted to tell me something about her. I took a deep breath. I was acutely aware that what I was about to say was going to hurt him. I saw her with someone. When? You saw her on Saturday night? No, it was Friday morning. His shoulders slumped. You saw her with... Who, a man? Yes. Have you told the police? I did, but I'm not sure they took me very seriously. I thought you should know. You saw her where? What was she doing? She was on your lawn. I pointed out to the garden. I saw her from the train. I take the train into London from Ashbury every day. I go right past here. I saw her. She was with someone. It wasn't you. And she kissed him. They were kissing. He stood, his hands still balled into fists, spots of colour on his cheeks. I'm sorry, I said. I'm so sorry. I know this is a terrible thing to hear. What did he look like, this man you saw her with? He was tall, taller than you, maybe. Dark-skinned. I think he might have been Asian, Indian, something like that. I don't know, said Scott. It could mean that she's all right. She's just run off with someone. He brushed a tear from his cheek with the back of his hand, and my heart screwed up into a tight little ball. But I can't believe she wouldn't call. She'd know how desperate I'd be. She's not vindictive like that, is she? He was talking to me like someone he could trust, like Megan's friend. I knew that it was wrong, but it felt good. You saw Megan from the train, so you were just looking out the window and there she was, a woman you happened to know. Well, I know where you live. I I've been here before, a long time ago, so sometimes I'd look out for her when I went past. She was often out there. So you knew Megan well enough to come round to the house? I shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't have complicated the lie. It was just one time. But I know where the house is because I used to live down the road, number 23. He nodded slowly. Watson. So you're, what, Tom's ex-wife? Yes. I started to get up. I should go now, I said. I've taken up enough of your time. He reached an arm out and placed his hand on my wrist. Don't go just yet. This man you saw her with. Do you think you'd recognize him again? I couldn't say that I had already identified the man to the police. My whole rationale for approaching him had been that the police hadn't taken my story seriously. If I admitted the truth, the trust would be gone. So I lied again. I'm not sure, but I think I might. Scott turned and marched out of the room and up the stairs. A few moments later he came back with a laptop and sat down at the kitchen table. He opened the machine and turned it on. Megan was seeing a therapist, he said. His name is Abdic, Kamal Abdic. He's from Serbia or Bosnia, somewhere like that. But he's dark-skinned. He could pass for Indian from a distance. He tapped away at the computer. I'm sure there's a website. I think there's a picture. He spun the laptop round so that I could see the screen. 
I leaned forward to get a closer look. That's him, I said. That's definitely him. The next day, Scott phoned. I just called to say thank you for yesterday, for taking the time to let me know. That's all right. Have you spoken to the police? Detective Sergeant Riley was here this afternoon. I mentioned Kamal Abditch, told her he might be worth speaking to. Well, what did she say? That they had already spoken to him, but would do so again. She asked me why I hadn't mentioned him before. She's supposed to be on my side, but all the time I feel like she's trying to trip me up. I'm stupidly pleased he doesn't like her. Another thing we have in common. He pauses. We had a terrible argument the night she left. Couples fight all the time, I said. But this was terrible. I was very unkind to her. She went upstairs and put some things in a bag. I noticed later that her toothbrush was gone, so I knew she wasn't planning on coming home. I thought she must have gone to Tara's for the night. That happened once before. I didn't even go after her. And that was the last time I saw her. Someone claims to have seen Megan, or a woman fitting her description, walking towards Whitney Station at around quarter past seven. No one remembered seeing her on the platform or on the train. And when did you try to contact her? A long silence. I went to the pub. I needed to cool down. I had a couple of pints and I went back home. That was just before ten. I was hoping she'd be back, but she wasn't. So it was around ten o'clock when you tried to call her? No, I didn't. I watched some TV, then I went to bed. I imagined she'd be sitting in Tara's kitchen, you know, talking about what a shit I am. So I left it. Next morning I drove round there. Tara told me the last time she'd seen Megan was at their Pilates class on Friday night. That's when I started to panic. Monday morning. The hot weather has returned and the carriage is stifling today. I was late getting up this morning, and I didn't have time to check the news. A man with an iPad takes a seat next to me. He goes straight to a news site, and there it is, in big, bold letters. Man arrested in connection with Megan Hipwell disappearance. I forget myself and lean over. He looks up at me, affronted. I'm sorry, I say. I, I know her. The missing woman, I know her. Oh, how awful. Would you like to read the story? He hands me the tablet. A man in his thirties has been arrested in connection with the disappearance of Megan Hipwell, the Whitney woman, who has been missing since Saturday, 13th of July. A police spokesman said, We can confirm that we have arrested a man in connection with Megan's disappearance. He has not yet been charged with an offence. My hands are trembling as I hand the iPad back. As we approach Whitney Station, I leap to my feet. I run along the platform, down the stairs. I run past the underpass, stumbling at the corner of Blenheim Road. There are no vans parked outside Scott's house, no police cars. I step into the doorway. I don't know what I'm doing here. I just wanted to know. I turn to leave, and it's at that moment that the door opens. Before I have time to move, his hand shoots out. He grabs my forearm yanks me into the house and slams the door behind me. I can't have people coming to the door. There are photographers, journalists everywhere. There's no one out there, I said. But what are you doing here? It was on the news. Is it him? Have they arrested him? He nodded. Yes, early this morning. Detective Sergeant Riley was here. She came to tell me. He looks at me. Why did you come? I thought you wouldn't want to be alone. I'm not alone. He led me into the living room. There was a woman outside on the lawn, smoking. Tall, with salt and pepper hair. She was smartly dressed in black trousers and white blouse. As soon as she caught sight of me, she flicked a cigarette onto the paving stones and crushed it beneath her toe. Please, she said as she entered the kitchen. This is Rachel Watson, Mum, said Scott. The woman who contacted me about Abditch. 
Her gaze swept rapidly over me from head to toe. Well, Scott is very grateful to you for coming forward. We're obviously waiting now to find out what exactly is going on. She took me by the elbow and turned me gently towards the front door. Thank you for stopping by, Mrs. Watson. We really are very grateful to you. I found myself on the doorstep. The front door closed firmly behind me, and when I looked up I saw them. Tom, pushing a buggy, and Anna at his side. They stopped dead when they saw me. Anna raised her hand to her mouth and swooped down to grab her child. By midday, the police had named their suspect. They talked about evidence discovered at Dr. Abditch's home and in his car, but they didn't say what. I waited all day for more news. Tom called more than once. I didn't pick up. I know what he wants. He wants to know why I was at Scott Hipwell's house. Let him wonder. I waited and waited, and still no charge. Instead, I learned that he is a Bosniak, a survivor of the Balkans conflict, who came to Britain as a 15-year-old refugee. He lost his father and two older brothers at Srebrenica. He has a conviction for domestic violence. The more I heard about Kamal, the more I knew I was right to speak to the police about him. I was right to contact Scott. Around three o'clock, I got frustrated with hearing nothing about Megan, nothing about Kamal. So I went to the off-license and bought two bottles of white wine. I'm almost at the bottom of the first bottle when it happens. The ticker running across the bottom of the screen tells me that the suspect in the Megan Hipwell disappearance has been released without charge. I put my glass down and sit there, my eyes blurring over. They had him, and they let him go. Wednesday morning, I'm woken by a soft tapping at the door. Kathy pushes the door gently open and peers into the room. Rachel, are you all right? She catches sight of the bottle next to my bed. I'm too embarrassed to say anything. Are you not going into work? She doesn't wait for me to answer, just turns to go, calling back. You'll end up getting yourself sacked if you carry on like this. I should go after her and tell her. I was sacked months ago for turning up blind drunk after a three-hour lunch with a client, during which I managed to be so rude and unprofessional that I lost the firm his business. Downstairs I make myself a cup of coffee and look at my phone. I have three missed calls, one from Tom and two from Scott. The call from Tom was last night, as was the first call from Scott. The second call from him was this morning, a few minutes ago. My heart lifts a little. This is good news. Despite his mother, Scott still wants to talk to me. You should have told me, he says as soon as he picks up, what you are. My stomach is a small, hard ball. He knows. Detective Sergeant Riley spoke to me after they let him go. He denied having an affair with her, and the witness who suggested that there was something going on was unreliable, she said. An alcoholic. Possibly mentally unstable. She didn't tell me the witness's name, but I take it she was talking about you? The phone goes dead. Friday. I'm going to call Tom. I have to find out what I did that Saturday night. I'm certain that there is something I'm missing, something vital. I've been trying to get hold of you since Monday, says Tom when he answers the phone. I called your office. He lets that sink in. I need to talk to you, I say, about Saturday night. That Saturday night? You said I'd scared Anna. Well, you had. She saw you stumbling down the street. You shouted abuse at her. She came home to tell me so I went out to look for you. You were in the street. I think you might have fallen. You had blood on your hand. I told you I'd take you home, but you walked off. I went to get the car, but when I came back, you'd gone. I drove around a bit, then called you a couple of times. I left a message. I'm sorry, Tom. I'm really sorry. Rachel, why were you at the Hipwell's house on Monday? Please tell me, so I can put Anna's mind at ease. She's worried. I had something to tell him about Megan. 
She was having an affair with her therapist, Kamal Abditch. I saw them together. Really? The guy they arrested? I thought they let him go. They have. And it's my fault. Because I'm an unreliable witness. Monday, the 29th of July. It's 8.07 and I'm on the train. I get off at Whitney. It's pouring and I hurry through the rain to Scott's house. When he opens the door, I say, please, can I talk to you? I want to apologise, to explain. He goes upstairs to fetch me a towel while the kettle boils. The house is less tidy than it was a week ago. My mother was driving me insane, cleaning, tidying up after me. We had a bit of a row. She hasn't been round for a few days. I follow him into the kitchen. I'm so sorry about what happened, he shrugs. They didn't have enough to charge him with. He hands me the mug and we sit down at the table. They found hair, skin cells in his house, and he admitted that she had been there twice, just to talk. He won't say what about. There's a whole confidentiality thing. The hair and the skin cells were found downstairs, nothing up in the bedroom. He swears blind that they weren't having an affair. There was a trace of blood on his car. Oh my God. Yeah matches her blood type. They don't know if they can get any DNA because it's such a small sample. He looks at me. He told the police that she was unhappy with me and she might have run off. He's trying to shift suspicion, I say. They seem to buy everything that bastard says. That Riley woman. I can tell when she talks about him. She likes him. The poor, downtrodden refugee. Maybe he's right. We did have that awful fight. His eyes are on my face. What happened with you? You left your husband. Was there someone else? I shake my head. Other way round. Anna happened. I know what he's going to ask, so I say, It started before. The drinking. While we were still married. We were trying for a baby. Still, after all this time, Every time I talk about it, the tears come to my eyes. We were trying for a baby and it didn't happen. I became very depressed. I started to drink. I was extremely difficult to live with and Tom sought solace elsewhere. And she was all too happy to provide it. Thursday morning, I'm flicking through channels until with a flash of recognition, I'm looking at Corley Wood which is just down the road from here. Corley Wood in pouring rain. For ten seconds, fifteen, I'm looking at blue and white tape and a white tent in the background. My breath is coming shorter and shorter until I'm not breathing at all. It's her. She's been in the wood all along, just along the railway track from here. There's a reporter on the screen now, dark hair slick against his skull. I listened to him tell me what I already know. The police have confirmed that the body of a young woman has been found submerged in flood water in a field at the bottom of Corley Wood. Police are saying that the body has yet to be formally identified. However, they believe that this is Megan Hipwell, who has been missing since early July. Mrs. Hipwell's husband has been informed. Thursday, the 13th of June, 2013. Scott thinks I'm at the cinema with Tara, but I went to Kamal's flat. I said there was something I had to tell him. As a friend, Kamal, not a therapist, please listen. He opens a cupboard and pulls out two tumblers. As a friend, then, would you like some wine? He shows me into the living room. We sit down on opposite sides of a glass table. My hands are locked around my glass. He's waiting for me to start, but it's hard. I've kept this secret for so long. I begin. After I left Ipswich, I moved in with Mac into his cottage outside Hokum. It was very isolated. 
days would go by and we wouldn't see anyone. It's odd thinking back on it, but I needed it then. After Ipswich and all those men, all the things I did. I liked it. Just Mac and me. I was happy. After Ben's death and everything that came after that, it was Mac saved me. To be perfectly honest, we were taking a lot of drugs. And it's difficult to get bored when you're off your face all the time. I was really happy. Come on, Nods. So what happened? I got pregnant. By the time I realised, it was too late to, to get rid of it. Of her. It's what I would have done had I not been so stupid. The truth is, she wasn't wanted by either of us. Kamal goes out and comes back with a sheet of kitchen roll for me to wipe my eyes. It's a while before I go on. We were both so stupid. We just carried on. I didn't see a doctor. Nothing really changed until she came. He lets me cry. After a while, I can go on. I had her at home. Mac had this friend who'd done some nursing training or something. And she came round. And it was... Okay. It wasn't so bad. I, I mean, it was painful and frightening, but... Then... There she was. She was lovely. She had dark eyes and blonde hair. She didn't cry a lot. She slept well right from the very beginning. She was a good girl. I look up, and Kamal is there, his eyes on mine. His expression soft. He wants me to tell him. We called her Elizabeth. Libby. Kamal comes round and sits beside me. He takes my hand in his. One day we had a fight, Mac and I. We did that every now and again. We'd scream at each other and I'd threaten to leave or we'd just walk out and I wouldn't see him for a couple of days. This was the first time it happened since she was born. First time he just went off and left me. It was freezing cold. I lit a fire in the living room, but it kept going out. I decided to get into the bath. I took Libby in with me. Put her on my chest. Her head just under my chin. And there I am again, lying in the water, my body sinking into the warmth. I'm exhausted. And then suddenly the candle is out, and I'm cold, my teeth chattering in my head, my whole body shaking. I fell asleep, I say, and then I can't say any more because I can feel her again. No longer on my chest, her body wedged between my arm and the edge of the tub, her face in the water. We were both so cold. Kamal puts his arm around my shoulder and pulls me to him. He isn't angry with me. He doesn't think I'm a monster. Saturday, the 3rd of August. I take the train to meet my mother who's coming up to London. Megan was everywhere, her face beaming from every newspaper, looking right into the camera, right at me. I close my eyes. At Northcote, someone gets on and sits down in the seat next to me. I don't open my eyes to look, but it strikes me as odd, because the train is half empty. Hello. I look up and recognise the man with the red hair, the one from the station from that Saturday. You remember me? Yes, a few weeks ago, at the station. He's nodding and smiling. I was a bit wasted, he says. Think you were too, weren't you, love? He picks up the newspaper. Awful, innit? Poor girl. It's weird, because we were there that night she went missing. You don't remember anything, do you? I don't want to be anywhere near this man. I want to get away from him. I scramble to my feet. 
Sorry, love, he says. Didn't mean to upset you. I walk away from him as fast as I can, right to the end of the train. I sit down and press my palms into my eye sockets. I concentrate. There it is. It's dark, and there's a man walking away from me. Also a woman in a blue dress. Anna? I don't know whether what I'm seeing is real or not. Imagination or memory. Saturday evening. Tom is meeting some of his army buddies for a drink, and Evie's down for her nap. I'm sitting in the kitchen, doors and windows closed, despite the heat. I'm bored. Can't think of anything to do. I can't watch television or look at a newspaper. I don't want to read about it. I don't want to see Megan's face. I don't want to think about it. What I can't stop thinking about is the fact that Rachel was here the night Megan went missing, stumbling around, totally pissed. And then she just disappeared. Tom looked for her for ages, but he couldn't find her. I can't stop wondering what she was doing. I remember the terror I felt when I saw her with Evie down by the fence. I think about that horrible, chilling little smile she gave me when I saw her outside the Hipwell's house. Detective Sergeant Riley doesn't know just how dangerous Rachel can be. The flat was empty when I got back. I poured myself a glass of wine, and then another, and then I phoned Scott. It's Rachel, I said. Rachel Watson. Oh, there was noise in the background, voices. Can we meet, I say. I, I want to talk to you about something. It's really not a great time. I've got a house full of people here. Tomorrow? Come by the house tomorrow. Scott stands aside, gesturing for me to enter the house. You wanted to tell me something. I wanted to ask you about Anna Watson, about her relationship with Megan. Did they like each other? He frowns. They didn't dislike each other. Megan just babysat for them for a while. They didn't have a relationship. Why are you asking me about this? I have to come clean. I think I saw her, outside the underpass by the station that night. The night Megan went missing. I was on my way to see Tom, my ex-husband. He rubs his forehead. Hang on a minute. You were here and you saw Anna Watson. What exactly are you saying? My face reddens with a familiar shame. I've been drinking. I don't remember exactly. But I've just got this feeling. Scott holds his hand up. Enough, I don't want to hear this. you got some problem with your ex's new wife, that's obvious. It's got nothing to do with me, nothing to do with Megan. I want to help. You can't. No one can help me. My wife is dead and the police think that I killed her. But Kamal Abditch, Kamal Abditch is no longer a suspect. Do you know what he's been saying? That Megan was unhappy. That I was an emotional abuser. He says Megan was afraid of me. He isn't the only one. That friend of hers, Tara. She says that Megan asked her to cover for her sometimes. That Megan wanted her to lie to me about where she was, what she was doing. I'm a guilty man. I'm good as convicted. He sits down and looks at me. You knew, Megan. You can talk to the police. You can at least tell them that I loved her, that we were happy. I can feel panic rising in my chest. He's pinning his hopes on me, and all I have for him is a bloody lie. They won't believe me, I say. I'm an unreliable witness. You were in Whitney the night Megan went missing. I nod. But I didn't see anything. I don't remember anything. He walks over to the French doors and pulls back the curtain. The sunshine is blinding. You were drunk, but you must remember something. You must. Think. What did you see? Blinking into the sunlight, I try desperately to piece together what I saw. I think I remember being in the underpass. It was dark. I was frightened. I remember blood. Blood on my head. Blood on my hands. He's waiting for me to say something, to offer him some crumb of comfort, but I have none. On the train on the way home, 
I think that if there's something in my head, then maybe someone can help me get it out. A therapist. Someone like Kamal Abdich. Tuesday. Yesterday morning I made an appointment to see Dr. Kamal Abdich. His receptionist said he could see me today at 4.30. Everything about him was warm. His hand when I shook it. His eyes. The tone of his voice. And for a while I forgot to be afraid of him. I tried to remember what I had to say. And I said it. I told him that for four years I'd had problems with alcohol. That my drinking had cost me my marriage and my job. It was costing me my health, obviously. And I feared that it might cost me my sanity too. I don't remember things, I said. I black out. And I can't remember where I've been or what I've done. And if someone tells me something I've done, it doesn't even feel like me. It's hard to feel responsible for something you don't remember. I spilled all this truth in front of him in the first few minutes. He listened, his clear amber eyes on mine, his hands folded. Eventually he nodded slightly. All right, can we go back a bit? To when the problem started. You said it was four years ago? Can you tell me about that time? I resisted. I wasn't going to tell him how I longed for a baby. I told him that my marriage broke down, that I'd always been a drinker, but that things had got out of hand. Your marriage broke down, so you left your husband, or he left you? He had an affair. He met another woman and fell in love with her, he nodded, waiting for me to go on. It was my fault. Why do you say that? Well, the drinking started before. Can you point to an underlying cause? I shook my head. I wasn't going to tell him that. He glanced at the clock on his desk. We'll pick up next time, perhaps. He smiled, and I went cold. Everything about him is warm. His hands, his eyes, his voice. Everything but the smile. I left his office without shaking his outstretched hand. I couldn't stand to touch him. Wednesday, the 7th of August. Ashbury isn't really a good place to walk. There isn't even a decent park. I head off through the middle of town, lost in thought, wondering what these sessions with Kamal are supposed to achieve. Am I really planning to trap him into saying something revealing? Chances are he's a lot cleverer than I am. This is what I am thinking, head down, eyes on the pavement. When out of the corner of my eye I see her name. I look up, and it's there, on the front of a tabloid newspaper stuck into a rack. Was Megan a child killer? Even though the story online sounds rather vague, I was trembling. My legs felt shaky, unsteady. It has been alleged that Megan Hipwell may have been involved in the unlawful killing of her own child ten years ago. Sources speculate that this could be a motive for her murder. We had let a possible child murderer babysit our daughter. I tried to call Tom but his phone went straight to voicemail. I left a message to ring me back as soon as possible. When Tom rang, he was in between meetings. He couldn't come home. He made all the right noises. You know you can't believe half the stuff they print in the papers. I didn't make too much of a fuss, because he was the one who suggested that Megan come and help out with Evie in the first place. When he walked in the door that evening, I went for him. I was building up to it all day. I couldn't hide from it. She was everywhere I looked. Here, in my house, holding my child. Feeding her. Changing her. Playing with her while I was taking a nap. I kept thinking of all the times I left Evie alone with her and it made me feel sick. Every time I close my eyes, I see her. Sitting there at the kitchen table with Evie on her lap. She'd be playing with her, and smiling and, and chattering. 
it never seemed as if she really wanted to be there. She always seemed so happy to be handing Evie back to me when it was time for her to go. It was almost as though she didn't like the feel of a child in her arms. The heat is insufferable. I'm taking my second shower of the day when the phone rings. It's Scott. He sounds panicky. I can't go home. There are cameras everywhere. I must go somewhere they won't be waiting for me. I'm just driving around. I've been driving around since I left the police station. I just need an hour or two to sit, to think. Could I come to your house? I say yes, of course. I want to see him. I want to help. Ten minutes later, the doorbell rings. I'm sorry to do this, he says as I open the front door. I didn't know where to go. I show him into the living room and fetch a glass of water. He drinks it, almost in one gulp. He looks up at me. My wife is dead and the police think that I killed her. Then comes this story about the death of a child. And today I got the news that Megan was pregnant. He starts to cry and I'm choking too. The horror of it is almost too much to bear. For Scott, the world is ending and I stand there, mute, helpless, useless. I hear footfalls on the steps outside. The familiar jangle of Cathy fishing around in her huge handbag for a house keys. It jolts me to life. I grab Scott's hand. Come with me. I drag him into the hallway and up the stairs before Cathy unlocks the door. I close the bedroom door behind us. My flatmate. She might ask questions. You should stay here a while. Try to sleep. He looks at me and almost smiles. You don't mind? When I'm sure that he's fallen asleep, I lie down at his back. When I wake, hours later, he's gone. Thursday morning. I feel treacherous. Scott left me just hours ago, and here I am on my way to see Kamal, to meet once again the man he believes killed his wife, his child. Kamal starts out by asking when I last had a drink. Sunday, I say. That's good. You look well. He smiles. And I don't see the killer. I'm wondering now what I saw the other day. Did I imagine it? You asked me last time about how the drinking started, he nods. I was trying to get pregnant. I couldn't, and I became depressed. I find myself crying again. It's impossible to resist the kindness of strangers. I confide in him, and I forget, once again, what I'm doing here. I don't study his eyes for some sign of guilt or suspicion. I let him comfort me. He is kind, rational. He talks about coping strategies. I leave Kamal Abditch's office feeling lighter, more hopeful. I sit on the train and try to conjure up the killer I saw, but I can't see him any longer. Friday evening. The train stops at the signal. I take a sip from the cold can of gin and tonic and look up at his house. I was doing so well. But I need this. Dutch courage. Scott asked me to come and I couldn't refuse him. They found the little girl last night. What was left of her? Buried in the grounds of a farmhouse, near the East Anglian coast, just where someone had told them to look. It was in the papers this morning. I phoned Scott when I saw the news. Are you all right? I said. No. Can you come here? Please, I want some company. Someone who knew Megs, who liked her. Someone who doesn't believe all this. Thursday, the 20th of June. I'm sitting on the sofa in his living room, a glass of wine in my hand. Okay, again. Do you feel ready to finish what you were telling me before? I close my eyes, and it doesn't take me long to get back there. Back to the bathroom. I remember waking up to hear Mac calling for me. I was sitting on the floor in the bathroom. She was in my arms. I was so cold. 
Matt came up the stairs and turned on the light. And he was screaming in my face. I gave her to him and ran. I ran out of the house into the rain. I ran to the beach. I thought about going into the water, but I was too scared. He came for me eventually. He took me home. We buried her in the morning. I wrapped her in a sheet, and Mac dug the grave at the edge of the property. We put stones on top to mark it. That night, Mac said he had to meet someone. I thought maybe he was going to go to the police. He never came back. Did you see Mac again? No, never. I wonder if, now that we've spoken about this, it might help if you try to contact Mac to give you closure. I can't. What if he tells Scott? We think about it. He walks me to the door, his arm around my shoulders. I want to turn and kiss him, but I don't. Instead, I say, is this the last time I'm going to see you? He nods. Couldn't we? No, Megan, we can't. We have to do the right thing. Go home to your husband. Saturday morning, the 10th of August. I wake early. I can feel him behind me, warm and sleepy. I wriggle my hips, pressing against him a little closer. His voice says, Rachel, don't. I go cold. I'm not at home. It's exactly the same as the room I shared with Tom. But this isn't home. I roll over. Scott swings his legs over the side of the bed, his back to me. This is like the room I shared with Tom, but it's the one Scott shared with Megan. This room. This bed. This was wrong, I say. Yes, it was, says Scott. He goes into the bathroom and shuts the door. I lie back and close my eyes. What have I done? I remember him talking a lot when I first arrived. We sat in the kitchen drinking beers, and when the beers were finished, we sat outside on the patio. We drank and watched the trains go by, and talked about work and where he went to school, just like normal people. I can remember him smiling at me, touching my hair. I remember thinking the thought and embracing it. I wanted to be with Jason. I wanted to feel what Jess felt when she sat out there with him, drinking wine in the evening. I ignored the fact that Jess was nothing but a figment of my imagination. Scott comes out of the bathroom. I dress quickly and go downstairs. I should go, I say, and he doesn't argue. It's bright outside and I'm squinting into the hazy morning sunshine. I'm barely five feet away from her when I see Anna, standing next to her car, watching me. When she catches my eye, she almost runs towards her own front door. I drove back from the gym in Northcote this morning, and as I parked, there she was. I could hardly believe it. Rachel. I'm pretty sure she'd just left Scott's house. I was astounded, and when I brought it up with Tom, he was just as baffled. I'll get in touch with her, he said. I'll find out what's going on. You've tried that. I suggested that maybe it was time to take legal advice to look into getting a restraining order or something. But she isn't actually harassing us, is she? The phone calls have stopped. Don't worry about it, darling. I'll sort it. He's right, of course. But there's something up, and I'm not prepared to just ignore it. I think the time has come to take matters into my own hands. The next time I see her, I'm calling that police officer. The woman, Detective Sergeant Riley. She seemed sympathetic. I know Tom feels sorry for Rachel, but honestly, I think it's time I dealt with that bitch once and for all. Monday morning. We're in the car park at Wilton Lake, sitting side by side in Tom's car, windows down. 
I want to hold his hand and stay here all day. He called me last night and asked if we could meet. He said he needed to talk to me. Anna said she saw you. She thought you might be coming from Scott Hipwell's house. Is that right? He turned to face me, but he isn't actually looking at me. He seems almost embarrassed. You don't have to worry about it. Scott's been going through a terrible time. I've just been helping him out a bit. We've become friendly, that's all. I'm really concerned about this. Scott seems like a perfectly decent bloke, but you can't be sure, can you? You think he did it? He shakes his head. No, no, I'm not saying that. But I don't want anything bad to happen. To you. He smiles at me. I still care about you, Rach. I have to look away because I don't want him to see the tears in my eyes. Promise me you'll stay away from Scott Hitwell. Promise me, Rach. I promise, I say. And I mean it. And I can hardly see for joy, because I realise that he's not just worried about me. He's jealous. Dr. Abditch's welcome this morning seems a little half-hearted. I wonder if he's been told about Megan's pregnancy. I wonder if he's thinking about Megan's child. I ask him about recovering memories, about hypnosis. Well, some therapists believe that hypnosis can be used to recover repressed memories, but I don't do it. Subjects under hypnosis are very suggestible. The memories which are retrieved can't always be trusted. They aren't real memories at all. So is there anything I can do to try and recover what I've lost? It's possible, yes. Talking about a particular memory can help you clarify things. Focusing on senses other than sight often helps. Sound, smell, the feel of things. If you're thinking of a particular circumstance, you might consider retracing your steps, returning to the scene of the crime, as it were. So instead of going home, I've come to Whitney, and instead of scurrying past the underpass, I walk slowly up to its mouth. I place my hands against the cold, rough brick at the entrance and close my eyes. Nothing comes. I turn to leave. A woman is just coming round the corner. She's wearing a deep blue trench coat. Then it comes to me. A woman. Blue. Anna. She was wearing a blue dress and was walking away from me, walking fast. A car pulled up next to her, a red car. Tom's car. She opened the door and got in, and the car drove away. Yes, on that Saturday night I stood here, at the entrance to the underpass, and watched Anna getting into Tom's car. Only that doesn't make sense. I can't be remembering right, because Tom came to look for me in the car. Anna wasn't in the car with him. She was at home. I walk down Blenheim Road and stand under the trees for a while, opposite number 23. Tuesday evening. Tom texted to say he was going to be a bit late. He had to take a client out for a drink. Evie and I were in the bedroom, and I was getting her changed. I went to open the window, and that's when I saw Rachel, standing on the opposite side of the road looking at our house. Then she just took off, walking back towards the station. I'm sitting on the bed, shaking with fury. He told me he'd sorted this out, that he phoned her on Sunday and she'd promised she wouldn't be hanging around anymore. Deep inside me, a rotten seed has been planted. When Tom tells me she's not going to bother us any longer, and then she does, can't help wondering whether he's trying as hard as he can to get rid of her, or whether there's some part of him, deep down, that likes the fact that she can't let go. I go downstairs and find the card that Detective Sergeant Riley left. I dial her number quickly before I have time to change my mind. Wednesday morning. At breakfast, I break my promise to myself and mention Rachel. Whatever you said to her the other day, didn't do the trick. She was here last night, standing in the street right opposite the house. 
His face darkens the way it does when he's really angry. I told her to stay away. She promised not to come round here any longer. She looked fine. She looked healthy, actually. Back to normal. She looked fine, I say. And before he turns his back on me, I can see in his face that he knows he's been caught. I thought you said you spoke to her on the phone. He turns back to me, his face a blank. I knew you'd get upset if I saw her, so I hold my hands up. I lied. He smiles as he steps towards me. I'm sorry. She wanted to chat in person and I thought it might be best, okay? We met in a crappy coffee shop in Ashbury and talked for twenty minutes, okay? I let him get away with it, because I'm dealing with this now. I spoke to Detective Sergeant Riley yesterday evening. When I told her that I'd seen Rachel leaving Scott Hitwell's house, she seemed very interested. She wanted to know whether I thought they were in a sexual relationship. The thought hadn't crossed my mind. I can't imagine him going from Megan to Rachel. After Tom leaves for work, I sat thinking about our conversation at breakfast. I remember Tom once telling me that he was a good liar. He is a good liar. A natural. He certainly fooled me. When he came home on Monday night and I asked him about his day, he talked about a really tiresome meeting that morning. I listened sympathetically, not once suspecting that there was no meeting. At all the while, he was in a coffee shop in Ashbury with his ex-wife. Later, unloading the dishwasher, I'm thinking, yes, he does fool me. I think about that story about his parents, how he invited them to the wedding, but they refused to come because they were so angry with him for leaving Rachel. I always thought that was odd, because I've spoken to his mum, and she sounded kind, interested in me, in Evie. She's trying to get invited round, he said just so she can refuse. Power games. I didn't press the point. Thursday morning. I finally confessed to Cathy that I'd been out of work for months and she got me a job interview. A friend of hers has set up her own public relations firm and she needs an assistant. It pays next to nothing, but I don't care. This woman is prepared to see me without references. Cathy's told her some story about me having a breakdown but being fully recovered. The interview's tomorrow afternoon at this woman's home in Whitney. I was supposed to be spending the day polishing up my CV, and I was. Only Scott phoned. I want to talk to you. In person. Please, it's important. Despite myself, I felt bad for him. So I said yes, and I regretted it the second the word came out of my mouth. There's a story about Megan's dead child in the newspapers. Well, it's about the child's father, actually. They've tracked him down. His name's Craig Mackenzie, and he died of a heroin overdose in Spain four years ago. So that rules him out. Who does that leave? The husband and the lover, Scott and Kamal. When he opens the door, I can see that Scott's been drinking. I follow him into the kitchen. He opens the fridge and takes out a beer. Sit down, have a drink. I sit opposite him, and he pushes the beer bottle towards me. I pick it up and take a sip. They got the DNA results yesterday, says Scott. Detective Sergeant Riley came to see me last night. That child Megan was carrying, it wasn't mine. The funny thing is, it wasn't Kamal's either. So she had someone else on the go. She didn't confide in you about another man, did she? Come on. You and Megan were such good friends, you must have known about all her lovers. I'm getting a bad feeling about this. I get to my feet, but he's there in front of me, his hands gripping my arms, and he pushes me back into the chair. He grabs my handbag and throws it into the corner. Then he leans over me, his breath rancid in my face. You never even met her. Everything you said to me was a lie. I get to my feet. I try to speak calmly. I wanted you to know about Kamal. I saw them together. Like I told you. But you wouldn't have taken me seriously if I'd just been some girl on the train. I wanted to help you. I knew that the police always suspect the husband, and I wanted you to know that there was someone else. So you made up a story about knowing my wife. 
Detective Sergeant Riley told me. She was asking me about you, whether I was in a relationship with you. I said, we're not in a relationship, she's just an old friend of Megan's, she's helping me out. Then Riley said you never knew Megan. You're just a sad little liar with no life. My phone beeps. I take a step towards the bag, but Scott gets there before me. He tips the contents of my handbag onto the table. Phone, purse, keys. He picks up the phone and looks at the screen. He raises his eyes to mine, and they're suddenly cold. This is to confirm your appointment with Dr. Abditch at 4.30pm on Monday the 19th of August. <laughs> what the hell is going on? He dropped the phone on the table and is coming towards me. I'm backing away into the corner. He's gripping my shoulders, and it hurts so much I cry out. All this time you were working against me. You were giving him information, weren't you? Telling him things about me, about Meg's. It was you, trying to make the police come after me. No, it wasn't like that. I wanted to help you. He grabs hold of my hair at the nape of my neck and he twists. Scott, please, you're hurting me. He's dragging me towards the front door. Get out of my house. Friday morning. After I left Scott's, I ran down to number 23 and banged on the door. I was in such a panic, I didn't even care whether Anna was there. No one came, so I scribbled a note on a scrap of paper and shoved it through the letterbox. I told him we needed to talk. I didn't mention Scott. I didn't want Tom to go round there and confront him. God knows what might happen. I rang the police almost as soon as I got home. I asked to speak to Detective Inspector Gaskill but they said he wasn't available, so I ended up talking to Riley. Miss Watson, why were you in Scott Hipwell's house? He asked me to go see him. You were warned to stay out of this. You've been lying to him, telling all sorts of stories, and this is a person under a great deal of strain, at best. At worst, he might be dangerous. He is dangerous, that's what I'm telling you. He killed his wife. I'm sure of it. She gave a long sigh. Come to the station, make a statement, or we'll take it from there. And Miss Watson? Stay away from Scott Hitwell. My job interview went as well as it could. The big drawback will be having to come to Whitney all the time, to walk these streets and risk running into Scott or Anna and her child. Coming back, I'm almost at a station just passing the crown, when I feel a hand on my arm. I wheel around. It's him again. The red-haired man, pint in one hand. Are you all right? I didn't mean to scare you. He's knocked off early, he says, and invites me to have a drink with him. I say no, and then I change my mind. When he, Andy, as it turns out, brings me my gin and tonic, I say, I owe you an apology for the way I behaved on the train. I was having a bad day. It's all right. We're sitting opposite each other in the beer garden at the back of the pub. It feels safer here than on the street side. Perhaps it's a safe feeling that emboldens me. I wanted to ask you about what happened the night that woman disappeared. I'm afraid I was very drunk and I don't remember. Did you see me talking to anyone else? Anything like that? It's all right, says Andy. You didn't do anything bad. I was pissed too. We had a bit of a chat on the train. Then we both got off here at Whitney and you slipped on the steps. I helped you up and asked you if you wanted to go to the pub. But you said you had to go and meet your husband. That's it? No, about half an hour later I was heading down to the underpass and you'd fallen over. You'd cut yourself. I said I'd see you home but you wouldn't hear of it. I think there'd been a row with your bloke. He was heading off down the street. He was with a woman. They got into a car together and drove off. And then? Then you walked away. You kept saying you didn't need any help, so I left it. I went down through the underpass. That was it. I go back home and sit on my bed looking out of the window. Although what I remember tallies with what other people remember, something still feels wrong. Then it strikes me. Anna. It's not just that Tom never mentioned going anywhere in the car with her. It's the fact that when I saw her walking away, getting into the car, 
she wasn't carrying the baby. Where was Evie while all this was going on? Saturday, 17th of August. I didn't have much sleep last night. Lying here on the sofa, my eyelids start to feel heavy. I turn the TV down, roll over, so that I'm facing the sofa back, and pull the duvet over me, and I'm drifting off. And then, bang, I jerk upright. I saw it. I was in the underpass, and he was coming towards me. One slap across the mouth, and then his fist raised, keys in hand, searing pain as the serrated metal smashed down against my skull. Saturday evening. Tom and I have had another row about, inevitably, Rachel. I've been torturing myself because he lied to me about meeting her. Is something going on between them? She came by on Thursday, banging on the door and calling out for Tom. I didn't dare open up. With Evie here, I just couldn't risk it. I've no idea what she might do. She left a note. I called Detective Sergeant Riley and left a message saying that Rachel had been round again. She still hasn't rung back. I should have told Tom about the note, but I didn't want him to get annoyed with me for talking to the police, so I just shoved it in a drawer. Riley rang him tonight. He was fuming when he got off the phone. What's all this about a note? I told him I'd thrown it away. That's just the sort of thing she used to do. Ridiculously, I burst into tears and ran upstairs. I waited for him to come and make up like he usually does. But after about half an hour, he called. I'm going to the gym for a couple of hours. Before I could reply, the front door slammed. I decide that I'll remake the bed with fresh sheets. I'll spray a bit of aqua de palmer on the pillows, put on the black silk underwear he got me for my birthday. And when he comes back, I'll make it up to him. As I'm pulling the sheets off the bed, I almost trip over a black bag shoved underneath. His gym bag. He's forgotten his gym bag and hasn't come back for it. My stomach flips. Maybe he's in bed with her right now. I feel sick. I get down on my knees and rummage through the bag. All his stuff is there, washed and ready to go. And something else. A phone I've never seen before. I sit on the bed, the phone in my hand, my heart hammering. You don't keep spare mobile phones tucked away in gym bags unless you're hiding something. I press the power button but it's dead. I leave the bed half stripped and go downstairs. The coffee table has a couple of drawers filled with domestic junk. There are three old mobile phone chargers. The second one I try fits. I plug it in on my side of the bed and wait. Times and days. Monday at three, Friday, 4.30. Sometimes a refusal, can't tomorrow. About a dozen text messages, all from a withheld number. The call log has been erased. I hear footsteps on the pavement outside, and I know it's him. I go downstairs. Hello, he says. He's weaving just a little. They serve beer at the gym now, do they? He grins. I forgot my stuff. I went to the pub. He slips his arms around my waist and pulls me close. Tom, shh, he says. He kisses my mouth and starts unbuttoning my jeans. I don't want to, but I don't know how to say no. Sunday morning. I wake and it's still dark. Can't fall asleep again. All I can think about is the phone in the bedside drawer. Tom is sleeping peacefully. I slip out of bed, open the drawer, and take out the phone. 
Downstairs I slide the French doors open and step outside. The grass is damp beneath my feet. I walk almost as far as the fence before I log onto voicemail. Would I like to change my greeting? I dial, yes. There's a beep, and then I hear her voice. Her voice. Not his. Hi, it's me. Leave a message. I feel as though I'm going to faint. And then the light comes on upstairs. It's as though I've been blundering about in the dark for days, weeks, months. Then finally caught hold of something. At first, although it felt like a memory, I thought it must be a dream. But now I remember. Everything is a lie. I didn't imagine him hitting me and then walking away quickly. I saw him turn, shout. I saw him walking down the road with a woman. I saw him getting into the car with her. I didn't imagine it. And I realized then that I'd confused two memories. I'd inserted the image of Anna, walking away from me in her blue dress. But the woman getting into the car with Tom was wearing jeans and a red t-shirt. It was Megan. I hurl the phone over the fence. By the time I get back to the house, he's at the bottom of the stairs. What were you doing outside? Something woke me. I couldn't get back to sleep. He comes across and puts his arms around my waist. <laughs> you should have woken me. You shouldn't be going out there on your own. He kisses my lips. Let's go back to bed. I try to pull away from him, but he's not letting me go. I ring the doorbell. I wonder whether I should have called first. It's not polite to turn up early on a Sunday morning without calling, is it? No one comes to the door. I walk round the side of the house. I can hear the little girl chattering as I make my way along the path. And there she is. And Anna, too, sitting on the patio. I call out to her and hoist myself over the fence. She looks at me. I expect shock or anger, but she barely even looks surprised. Hello, Rachel. She gets to her feet, drawing her child to her side. What do you want? Where's Tom? He went out. Army boys get together. I say, we need to go, Anna. And she starts to laugh. All of a sudden, the whole thing seems very funny. Poor fat Rachel, standing in my garden, all red and sweaty, telling me we need to go. When I stop laughing, I say, I'm not going anywhere with you, Rachel. What are you doing here? Anna, she says, those intense dark eyes searching mine. Have you ever met any of his friends from the army? Have you ever been introduced to any of them? I shake my head. Don't you think that's odd? Not really. They belong to a different part of his life. And his family? Have you ever met Tom's parents? No. They stopped talking to him when he ran off with me. That isn't true. I've never met them either. They don't even know me, so why would they care about him leaving me? I don't believe you, I say. Why would he lie about that? Because he lies about everything. Yes, I say. He's a good liar. You were totally clueless for ages, weren't you? All those months we were meeting up and you never suspected a thing. Rachel bites her lip. Megan, she says. What about Megan? I know. They had an affair. So those phone calls weren't all from you. I know now that all this time I've been hating the wrong woman. Yet this doesn't make me dislike Rachel any less. Megan's baby, she says. Do you think it was his? There's a roaring in my ears. Like the sea. What did you say? Megan was pregnant when she died. I'm so sorry. Rachel sits at my side and puts her arm around my shoulders. I want to push her away, but I can't. She lets me cry for a while. And then she says, Anna, I think you should pack some things for you and Evie, and then we should go. This isn't just about an affair. Megan got into the car with him. That night. I saw her. I remember now. We have to speak to the police. Please, you can't stay here with him. 
I stand up, hauling Evie up with me. He couldn't have done this, Rachel. You know he couldn't. You couldn't love a man who would do that, could you? But I did, she says. We both did. Now she's looking over my shoulder. I turn to follow her gaze, and I see him at the kitchen window, watching us. Saturday, the 13th of July. I know what I have to do. I thought about it all day yesterday, and all night too, and I made my decision. I'm going to tell the truth. No more lies, no more hiding. Everything out in the open. If he can't love me then, so be it. We were outside on the patio. Scott was talking about work, and he caught me not quite listening. Am I boring you? I sat next to him on the edge of the paving and slipped my hand into his. I told him I loved him. Then I said I'd made some mistakes, and he let go of my hand. What sort of mistakes, Megan? There was... It's finished now, but there was... someone else. He stood up and, without looking at me, spat. I followed him into the house. Scott, please, just listen. It's not as awful as you think. It's over now. It's completely over. Please, listen. He grabbed me by the tops of my arms, and wrestling me across the room threw me against the opposite wall. My head rocked back, hitting plaster. I slide down the wall, tears running down my face. He's standing a few feet from me, saying something but I can't hear. I think he's saying that he's sorry. I haul myself to my feet, push past him, and run up the stairs, slamming the bedroom door behind me. I lock it. Megan, I'm sorry I hurt you. Forgive me, please. I can't think about that now. Right now, I have other things to do. At the very back of the wardrobe, there's a dark grey box marked Red Wedge Boots. And in that box, there's an old mobile phone that I keep charged. I sit on the bed and switch it on. I call his number and send a text. I need to talk to you. Urgent. Call me back. And I sit. And I wait. When we started all this, it was just a game. He'd pop by the gallery and smile and flirt, and it was harmless. But then the gallery closed, and I was here, at home, all the time, bored and restless. And then one day, when Scott was away, I bumped into him in the street. We started talking, and I invited him in for coffee. The way he looked at me, I could see exactly what was going through his mind. And so it just happened. And then it happened again. I don't remember when I started believing that we were right for each other. But the moment I did, I could feel him start to pull away. He stopped texting, stopped answering my calls. I hated it. So then it became something else, an obsession. I can hear Scott calling my name as I slam the door behind me. I walk to the park and then I dial Tom's number. I tell him that I'll wait for him, but if he doesn't come, that's it. I'm coming round to the house. This is his last chance. I walk round the park just once, but the phone stays silent. I head back towards his house. I've just passed the station when I see him. He's striding out of the underpass, and before I can stop myself, I call out. He turns to face me. The expression on his face is pure rage. Megan. What the hell? Come on, we can't talk here. The car's over there. As I get in, I glance back. The underpass is dark, but I feel as though someone's in there. 
in the shadows. Someone watching us go. Sunday, the 18th of August. The second she sees Tom, Anna runs into the house. I follow cautiously, stopping just short of the sliding doors. Inside they are embracing. His mouth is pressed to the top of her scalp, but his eyes are on me. What's going on here then, he says. I slip my hand into the back pocket of my jeans. My phone is there, hard and comforting. You think I don't remember anything, I say. But I do. I saw you the night Megan disappeared. After you hit me, you left me there, in the underpass. You got into the car with Megan. I watched you go. Anna, you know that he was sleeping with her. He turns to her. It was just a bit of fun. It was never going to last. It was never going to interfere with us, with our family. You must understand that. His face is a picture of contrition. I take out my phone. A second later, he's out of the room and I go sprawling onto the grass. The phone flies from my grasp. He has it in his hand before I can raise myself to my knees. He hoists me to my feet and leads me back into the house, sliding the glass door behind us. He locks it and tosses the key onto the kitchen table. What am I going to do with you, Rach? Saturday, the 13th of July. It's not until we get into the car that I notice he has blood on his hand. What happened to your hand? Problems with the ex, he says. We drive to Corley Wood in silence. We drive to the very end of the car park. It's a place we've been before. Tonight, we're alone. Tom switches off the engine and turns to me. Right, what is it you want to talk about? I suggest we walk a bit, and we go a little way in silence. Then I stop and turn to face him. Tom, I'm pregnant. I'm telling you this because, well, there's a possibility that the child could be yours. Lucky me to have an abortion. He turns and strides back up the path towards the car. I run after him, and when I get close enough, I shove him in the back. I'm yelling at him, trying to scratch his smug face, and he's laughing, fending me off with ease. I scream at him, I'm not going away for the rest of your bloody life. You're going to be paying for this. He's not laughing anymore. He's coming towards me. He has something in his hand. I've fallen. I must have slipped. Hit my head on something. Can't get up. My head is thick with sounds. My mouth thick with blood. Sunday, the 18th of August. We sit in the living room. Tom, his daughter, his wife and the ex-wife opposite. Very civilised. When we started, says Tom, it was just fun. But then she started talking about me leaving Anna and Evie, as if I would. That Saturday she called, saying she had something important to tell me. I ignored her, so she threatened to come to the house. I wasn't too worried. Anna was going out and I was going to babysit. If she came round, I might be able to have it out with her. But then you came along, Rachel and buggered everything up. Anna was back here after five minutes because you were out there, pissed as usual, stumbling around with some bloke outside the station. So instead of sorting things out with Megan, I had to go out and deal with you. God, the state of you. I took you back up the road into the underpass so you wouldn't be making a scene in the street. I told you to stay away. And you cried and whined, so I gave you a smack to shut you up. And then Megan came along. I couldn't let her talk to Anna, could I? So I told her we could go somewhere and talk. We got into the car and drove to Corley Wood. It was a place we sometimes used to go. Do it in the car. Anna flinched. She started going on about the baby. She didn't know if it was mine. I wasn't interested. And she got all upset, screaming at me, swearing. I needed her to stop. I put her in the boot of the car and I drove a bit further into the wood. 
I had to dig with my bare hands. It was painful. I'm calculating whether I can reach the front door before he can get hold of me. I pitch myself forward and run. I get into the hallway when I feel something hit the back of my skull. There's an explosion of pain and I crumple to my knees. Tom grabs me and drags me along the floor into the kitchen. She's bleeding, but I don't think it's serious. He hasn't finished it. I'm not really sure what he's waiting for. I suppose it's not easy for him. He did love her, once. He's sitting at the kitchen table, drinking a beer. I got myself one, and we drank them together. He told me he was really sorry about Megan, about the affair. He kissed me. He told me he'd make it up to me, that we'd be okay. He asked me if I could forgive him. And I said that I could, given time. And he believed me. I think he believed me. The storm starts, and the rumble of thunder wakes her. She starts to move around on the floor. You should go, he says to me. Go back upstairs. I kiss him on the lips, and I leave him. But I don't go back upstairs. Instead, I pick up the phone in the hallway, sit on the bottom stair, and listen. The handset in my hand, waiting for the right moment. There's a flash of light and I realise I can hear the rain pouring down. There's a storm, lightning. I'm on the floor. With difficulty, I manage to lift my head and raise myself onto one elbow. He's sitting at the kitchen table, looking out at the storm, a beer bottle between his hands. What am I going to do with you, Rach? He says, and he sees me raise my head. What choice are you giving me? He gets to his feet comes over to me and holds out his hands. Come on, Rach, grab hold. Up you come. I let him pull me to my feet. He's standing in front of me, against me, his hips pressing against mine. He wipes the tears off my cheekbones with his thumb. What am I supposed to do with you, Rach? You don't have to do anything. I try to smile. You know that I love you. I still do. You know I wouldn't tell anyone. I couldn't do that to you. He slips his hand around my waist. I press my hips against his. I can feel him getting hard. I slip my hand into the drawer behind me, and my right hand closes around a familiar object. I smile and lean into him, snaking my left hand around his waist. Then I lunge forward, pressing all my weight against him throwing him off balance, so he stumbles back against the kitchen table. I raise my foot and stamp down on his as hard as I can, and as he pitches forward in pain, I grab a fistful of hair at the back of his head and pull him towards me, while at the same time driving my knee up into his face. He cries out. I push him to the floor, grab the keys from the kitchen table, and am out of the French doors before he's able to get to his knees. I head for the fence, but I slip in the mud and lose my footing and he's on top of me before I get there, dragging me backwards, pulling my hair, clawing at my face, spitting curses through blood. I get away from him again and run to the bottom of the garden, down towards the tracks. Dead end. I stand on the spot where a year or more ago I stood with his child in my arms. I turn, my back to the fence, and watch him striding purposefully towards me. He wipes his mouth with his forearm spitting blood to the ground. I can feel vibrations from the tracks in the fence behind me. The train is almost upon us. It sound like a scream. Tom's lips are moving. He's saying something to me, but I can't hear him. I watch him come. I watch him. And I don't move until he's almost upon me. And then I swing. I jam the vicious twist of the corkscrew into his neck. He raises his hands to his throat, his eyes on mine 
and he falls without a sound. I watch until I can't look any longer. Then I turn my back on him. As the train goes past, I can see faces in the brightly lit windows, travellers warm and safe on their way home. I try not to think about what came after. I try and I fail. Side by side, drenched in his blood, we sat on the sofa, Anna and I, the wives waiting for the ambulance. Anna called them. She called the police. She took care of everything. The paramedics arrived, too late for Tom, and on their heels came uniform police, then the detectives, Gaskell and Riley. Their mouths literally fell open when they saw us. They asked questions, but I could barely move. Anna spoke, calm and assured. It was self-defence. I saw the whole thing, from the window. He went for her, with a corkscrew. He would have killed her. She had no choice. I tried to stop the bleeding, but I couldn't. I couldn't. When I turned back to watch him die, the train had passed. I heard a noise behind me and saw Anna coming out of the house. She walked quickly towards us, and reaching his side, she fell to her knees and put her hands on his throat. I wanted to say, it's no good, you won't be able to help him now. But then I realised she wasn't trying to stop the bleeding. She was making sure, twisting the corkscrew in, further and further. And all the time she was talking to him, softly, softly. I couldn't hear what she was saying. The last time I saw her was in the police station, when they took us to give our statements. She was led to one room and I to another, but just before we parted she touched my arm. You take care of yourself, Rachel. It felt like a warning. We're tied together, forever bound by the stories we told, that I had no choice but to stab him that Anna tried her best to save him. Eventually, I suppose, the nightmares will stop. But right now I know there's a long night ahead. And I have to get up early tomorrow morning. To catch the train. The Girl on the Train was written by Paula Hawkins.